All right, well, good afternoon. Thank you all for hanging on for me. And uh, I know you've got a few other presenters after me, so um, I'm going to try and be as quick as I can. Um, Brendan asked me to, to give a presentation, and he was very um, loose and said I could speak on anything. So anything to obviously to do with my, my area. So um, after some, some deal of uh, uh, thought, I decided that what I would do is I would gear my talk, um, as you would expect, towards things that would come up in the construction industry. So um, I have um, going to give you a presentation today on Bermuda's interesting residents and their relatives, and it's not what you think. <laughs> so my name is Claire Jesse, and I'm an entomologist with the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. My actual working title is a plant protection officer but my degree is in applied entomology and pest management. And so entomology, for those of you that don't know, I'm sure you all know, it's, um, it's the study of things that are cut into pieces. And insects and many of their relatives have many joints in their bodies, and so entomology is the study of insects and their relatives. So basically, um, what I'm gonna do in this presentation is to talk to you briefly about some of the residents that we have that might be encountered in the construction industry um, and any uh, construction components that are being shipped to Bermuda. And I'm focusing on things that are interesting, can sting, or bite. So for those of you that are, if anybody's new to the island, um, I've just thrown in the onion picture for reference as we refer to most of our residents as onions. Um, but uh, for those that come from other countries, you perhaps might not understand why we have a picture of onions there for Bermuda residents. Anyway, so the one I'm going to start with first is one of the most interesting ones, and it's the tailless whip scorpion. And you've probably never seen it, and I must admit that until I worked with the Department of Environment, I had never seen one either, but I have several times since then now. And these are very unusual looking insects. Uh, well, not insects, they're related to insects. They're, they look very prehistoric. They're quite large, as you can see by the picture um, in proportion to the person's hand. And they are resident, believe it or not, in Front Street and Reed Street underneath the, um, the street area in all of the storage uh, areas underneath the shops. And um, they found them when they removed the flagpole uh, and replaced it maybe, I don't know, it was probably about 30 or 40 years ago, they replaced the wooden flagpole. And in the hole, in the ground, was filled with these um, tailless whip scorpions. And also periodically I get them turned into me from um, shops that have storage areas under the ground, which is very common on the ones on Front Street um, and Reed Street, and they are living in the dark. They have very vestigial or rudimentary eyes, um, so they roam around in the dark, and the first pair of legs has been fashioned into, uh, no, the second pair of legs has been fashioned into very long feelers, and that's the long things that are stretching out on the sides, and that is to have assist them with um, finding prey in the dark. And so naturally what they're looking for in the dark is probably things that live in the dark, and that would be cockroaches. So for the most part, that is their prey. And so that explains the big, strong, heavy looking um, jaw legs that are in the front. And those are not um, particularly damaging to people in any way, but they are for grabbing and crushing the prey and pulling it into their mouth parts, which they will then assume. They're nocturnal, they mostly come out at night, which makes sense because that's when their prey comes out at night. But they've also, they show an unusual feature for insects and their relatives in that they take care of their babies. Many insects and spiders, they simply have an egg sac or they have the eggs and then they leave them to their own devices. And there's only a handful of insects and relatives that actually take care of their own babies. And so what these guys do is they put their babies on their back uh, and they wander around with them on their back until they're big enough to cook on their own. And the unfortunate part is if the babies fall off, it's too bad, it's over. But those that survive were the ones that hang on to the mother and eat little bits of the prey that she's caught. And interestingly enough, you might see them occasionally used in shows like Fear Factor, where you remember they would make people do horrible things and eat horrible things and be in cages in, in confined spaces with horrible things. And this was one of the creatures that they used. And um, it looked dreadful, but there is actually no risk to people whatsoever. Now this, on the other hand, there is a risk. This is our tropical centipede, which many of you might recognize. Um, it's, uh, the genera name is Scolopendra, and that's because of uh, Scolo is the drain and Pendra is to hang. And it's often ha found in other countries hanging around moist outdoor drains, road drainage systems and those sorts of things. They like the dark, they like the damp. Um, 
they demonstrate what we call aposematic colors, which are the, the dangers, things that indicate that it's got a bite or a sting, and that would be the red, the yellow, the black. Um, and so those are the aposematic colors. They're typically bright and colorful. They have very poor vision, and so they do, uh, they do uh, not see their prey as much as smell their prey, and then they can uh, attack it, and um, they, are, they have a nasty, nasty bite. Uh, not a bite, but it's actually a sting from the front legs which are modified to have venom in them. And so it can actually pierce the skin and give quite a nasty sting, which I understand for people who have been stung, um, that it is uh, akin to a bee sting. So it's nothing particularly dangerous, but for those people that have immune systems, uh, or the young or the elderly immune systems that are compromised in any way, they may have a reaction to this, which might be worse than other people. It also shows maternal care, which is a little unusual. They lay a batch of eggs, and they actually curl around them and take care of them and keep them moist and keep them protected. Um, but they can actually be carnivorous, and in some countries they have been known to eat small birds and small bats. Um, so they are a very interesting creature, and we have, our own, we have our own resident populations here. This is something that you might come across in a house. It's a little unusual, and I throw it up here. I've only seen maybe three in the 20-something years that I've worked at the department, and it's a house centipede. It's not hazardous in any way. In fact, it roams around eating little insects and little spiders, and so it's kind of beneficial. Lives inside the house, um, and the, one of the interesting things about it is that with all those legs, um, if a predator comes along and tries to take a bite out of it, it will often release those legs and go on without its legs, and that's uh, the evasive action that it can take to try and um, to stay alive. Um, so interestingly, I made a note there that it's three years before it reaches the adult stage, which is very, very, uh, it's quite a, a vulnerable position to be in for an insect if you take that long to get to your uh, adult stage, because insects obviously are under our feet and in corners and um, being attacked by other things. So three years is a long time to try and stay alive before you can even reproduce. So it's quite a dangerous uh, situation, but nevertheless, they manage to do it. They hide in dark corners in houses stay out of the way and um, they can survive. I've just thrown a silver fish in here because uh, they're just so odd looking and um, many people are familiar with them. They live inside houses. You can often find them feeding on the starches in books and things like that. Um, again, they're not hazardous in any way, but they are very similar to exactly the same uh, shape and, and uh, not, as, not as small, but uh, back in the, when the dinosaurs were around, the fossils are actually very similar to the ones that we see today. And you can look at them and say they are a bit unusual looking. They don't look like regular insects. And they're not actually insects. They're related. Um, but they're very, very similar to their ancestors from millions and millions of years ago. They have a very strange mating ritual where uh, they do kind of a dance. And normally I get quite sort of active at this stage, but I'm going to turn it down tonight. Um, they kind of do this kind of like, hi, how are you doing? And then they walk away. And it's like, OK, I think she likes me. OK, hi. So how are you doing? Okay. Oh, you want to dance? Okay. And they do a little dance thing, and then they go off and they mate. And it has been observed that that is the pattern of what they'll do. They'll go, say hello, go away, come back, say hello again, check each other out, and do their thing. It's really quite interesting. Another vulnerability about them, which makes them rather unusual, is that insects molt only a handful of times. Because when you molt, you lose your skin, and your new skin is not hard. It is, it is not able to protect you from predators. And um, so it's a very dangerous, vulnerable stage for an insect to be in. This one molts between 16 and 66 times, which again is very, very risky for an insect. So it's a very prehistoric feature that this is still, um, this one is still uh, exhibiting. Whereas today's insects have refined all the characteristics to those that best help them survive. And so molting less times is actually safer and uh, less risky. Honeybees, they're in here because I put, I've included them because they sting, everybody knows them. Just out of interest, I've, uh, the, the top picture shows you the very large queen bee, the male, which is the drone, and the little one is the worker. And the male uh, is the one that does not have a sting. So if you were for a chance to pick up a bee, I would suggest you pick up the male because it does not have a sting. Once, and it's very seasonal as well. Once it's been around and mated with the queen, it's over. The, the little workers will, well, the workers, not the little workers, the, um, the workers will not take care of it. They won't feed it. It's a waste of energy and resources. And so they will let them leave the hive and go away. And often they kick them out and it's over. So they, they play a, a short role. And then everybody else in the hive that remains for the rest of the year will be female. I just put the little picture on the side that says Varroa might because 
within the last hmm, about six years, I guess, um, uh, we we found an infestation of varroa mites, and we were free of varroa mite, which was a very unusual position to be in because a varroa mite is a parasite that attacks bees, and it's in every other country of the world except us. And then we got it. We don't know how it got here. And in fact, I can talk about that later. We don't know how the, the mite got here. It has to live on bees. And we had prohibited the entry of live bees for some years because of other problems to do with colony collapse and other disorders. So we do not know. So it's possible that somebody smuggled some bees in. It's possible they came in as a swarm. Or it is possible that um, as apitherapy is becoming more popular, where you sting yourself, uh, and it's said to relieve things like <coughs> arthritis and um, some sort of, uh, you know, sometimes people that are suffering from uh, immune issues can find some relief, or pain issues can find some relief from apitherapy, which is the stings of the bees. Um, and it's possible that somebody may have brought in a cup full of bees for apitherapy, and if there was some left that they didn't need, they may have released them, and those bees may have had the mite on it. We just don't know how it got here. We do have another bee here, interestingly, that hardly anybody will ever see, and I have never seen in real life, but yet I know it exists, and we, this picture actually was taken of it, was taken in Bermuda and not very long ago, and it's called a solitary bee, and it just lives off some of the islands um, around Nonsuch, the very small islands where people don't go, and um, basically it lives on its own, which is unusual for a bee, uh, and it makes little notches out of the leaves, um, takes those leaves back and makes itself a little nest and it has its babies in, uh, in little crevices in the rocks. And it's rare, it's, it's protected, and um, it's unlikely you'll ever see it, but I just included it in there because it is interesting. Um, so we do have also in the stinging department, we have mud and paper wasps. And in the construction industry, you may see these blobs of mud that in your world just look like blobs of mud. Um, and in fact, they are more likely to be Particularly when they're up high, it's not like somebody's logged mud up in the top. It's usually uh, a nest that a wasp has made. And inside will be several babies. So the picture that has uh, one of the nests cut open has some of the pupa of the developing wasps. And each one will hatch out. And interesting, like, what they do is the adult wasp will make the mud nest and put one egg in it. And it will paralyze something like a spider or a grasshopper, stuff it in there with the egg, and close it over. The egg will hatch, feed on the paralyzed insect, but it's still alive, um, but is unable to escape or protect itself. And um, the, that's enough food to help that immature insect, the immature wasp, get through to uh, adult. And then out of that, you'll see on the middle picture that there's some circular holes. That's where the adult uh, wasp has actually emerged and it's flown away. Um, on the right-hand side, I've, on the bottom, I've put a picture of a paper wasp nest because we do have what we call the red bee here, and that's a type of paper wasp. We do have a couple other wasps that make paper nests, and they chew up the bark of trees and leaves and things, and they make a paper out of it, and they make their nest out of that. Um, and they, uh, the mud wasp actually looks like the one on the top at the end, the black and white, that's very similar to the type of wasp we have. And so they can give a nasty <coughs> sting, and the difference with wasps and bees is that they can sting repeatedly, whereas a bee will sting once, and then the only problem with bees is there's lots of them. And they have a pheromone that they release that tells all their friends to come. So when you get stung by a bee, all their friends know about it and will come. Whereas a wasp will sting you, but sting over and over and over and over. Um, but it's uh, less likely to bring all its friends. Termites, I'm sure you all know, but the interesting thing here, I get a lot of questions, people coming in, they bring me samples and they say, oh, I think I've got termites. When in fact, they've got flying ants. And one of the visual differences that you can tell is with an ant, it has a very narrow waist. So if you look at that picture on the top, um, you'll see that the one on the right has kind of a wider body all the way down. The one on the left has a head, uh, then the, uh, the thorax, and then a very narrow waist before the abdomen. And that's the difference. That's how you can tell the difference between ants and um, termites. And then, of course, you might recognize the little piles of what we call frass, but they are the droppings of the termites. After they've chewed the wood, they find a hole, and they generally toss out all the droppings because they don't want to sit in the wood with their droppings. That's not, you know, their, most insects are relatively clean. And so they will um, turf everything out uh, out of a hole. And the picture I put with the bottom um, that shows the wood, interestingly, they found that the termites will get in the wood and they will often leave the varnish or painted surface because, of course, you can imagine that tastes a little different. And so they don't like to eat the varnish or the paint, typically. 
so they often eat the wood out from underneath. And that's why when you're walking on something and all of a sudden it gives, it's because they've left the top surface and they've eaten out underneath. So that's just a demonstration of what's going on there. So ants, we do have uh, a lot of ants on the island. Well, not a lot of ants. We have a bunch of ants on the island. Some you'll, uh, you, would, you might assume is just the only one we have, which is the Argentine ant, which is the one you'll see 99% of the time. Um, and it's one of the most invasive species in the world. And it's everywhere. And um, they've determined that some of the colonies can be, I think they said, what, 3,000 miles wide. So they are all sort of grouped together. And they say it's on par with human beings, that we all live in these big city colonies. And at these Argentine ants do the same sort of thing. And they all get along with each other. And interestingly, they did some experiments that showed that if they fed them different diets, even though they were from the same uh, nest, from the same eggs, if they were fed different food, they didn't recognize each other. So obviously, they had worked out that diet then affects how the ants smell. So those ants that um, smell differently will be attacked as invading ants. And so um, all of these things are sort of very interesting to see how everything interconnects. And they're all sort of social, but then they can tell that they're different. It's very interesting. We also have a big-headed ant, which you might not see. But once you've seen it, you'll know it, because it has quite a substantially large head. And there's two sizes, and we call them majors and minors. And they have different work. Obviously, the, the big-headed ant has very strong jaws because of its big head. And uh, it's a defensive ant. And the little one is generally in the nest, taking care of the queen, cleaning, um, foraging, that sort of thing. And interestingly, with all these experiments, they spend all this time doing lots of experiments on insects to find out interesting things. And they've discovered that um, as the major ant gets older, its brain gets bigger. And that is because it has to do more and more away from the nest. And it gets sort of, I don't want to say braver, but it gets it ventures out further. And in order to find your way back, you have to have enough brain power to be able to remember where you came from, follow the scent trail back to where you came from. So they found that it actually changes as they grow. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is they exhibit prophylaxis, which is where they share the food, but they're also sharing pheromones and scent. So that feeds into the whole colony thing, and they all live together, and they all smell the same. And that's, um, that helps with recognizing your nest mates and not having to attack everybody. We also have a little thief ant, which is relatively common, and you might find in the kitchens attacking your food periodically. Very, very tiny. It's often overlooked because it's so small. But it does raid other ant nests and often lives in the other ant nests and is able to, um, or have trails to the other ant nests. And it's called the thief ant because it'll often steal brood, the, the immatures, or their food, um, and, and it survives that way. Um, and it has quite, um, quite good trails that it lays down, which are chemical trails, to help it to find the food. So it can live a little way away and lay a trail, and they're very tight how they stay to the, the chemical trail that's laid down to get to whatever nest or piece of food. The other interesting ant, which is on the island, you will probably not see, is called the trap jaw ant. And it has these enormous long jaws at the front. And they are supposed to be the fastest moving predatory appendages in the animal kingdom. Um, so basically, the ant will walk around. And that is the closed position. The open position is uh, wide open to the side. And it will walk around like that. And then when it finds its prey, it will snap and close. And that is extremely fast. So um, they are very rare, but there are pockets of them in Bermuda. We had um, an ant scientist come and do some survey, and he couldn't find them. And then, lo and behold, somebody brought me some in a bottle from the runway of the airport. And there they were, living in a log on the side of the runway. And um, since then, I've had one or two other little pockets of them. I think there's one in Tuckerstown. Um, and there's little hot spots. And they're obviously able to get themselves a little colony, not be invaded by all these other ants. And they are, and they're not thriving, but they're coping and they're surviving, which is kind of interesting. I don't like talking about cockroaches at all. My degree is in entomology, and I grew up here, and I'm, a, I'm on the chair with the with everybody else because I cannot stand cockroaches. And when I was at university and we studied uh, the insects, we had lab sessions and we had to dissect things, and then they had to dissect these cockroaches. And fortunately for me, I had a lab partner, so I stood way back here, and I think like, you go along. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I am not going to dissect any cockroaches any time soon. But here they are. So they're very similar to the fossils that they had millions and millions of years ago. They think they came here, and they certainly traveled to all sorts of other areas on ships and cargo ships. Um, uh, they think they moved originally from Africa and then around, and 
that once they got on boats, they were able to travel everywhere. Um, they're quite quick, quick moving, I mean. Um, but interestingly, they take a long time to develop. And so in the egg case, they can be six to eight weeks before the egg hatches. So in that egg case, there'll be about 30 or 40 little tiny cockroaches that will hatch out. And then it takes each of them about six or 12 months to mature, which again, is quite a long time, which I don't believe is true, because I'm sure that they breed much more quickly than that in my house. Um, <laughs> but they can live for about two years, which again, is quite a long time, but they don't live that long in my house, because if I, as soon as I see you, it's game over. <coughs> so anyway, they can transmit diseases and things like that, because they are traveling um, you know, through trash and litter and feces and all sorts of things that they find interesting, and they can spread that around. We also also have the German cockroaches and the lobster roach. And uh, I mean, none of these are stinging or anything like this, but they are the type of thing you'll find when you're sort of maybe doing reconstruction, construction, that sort of stuff. Um, so the lobster, we'll start with the lobster roach, the one on the bottom. It can't fly, kind of unusual looking. It doesn't creep me out quite as much as the other ones. It's kind of a light beige color. Um, and it's often used, it's often bred for animal food because it doesn't fly, so it doesn't escape, and so it's easy to breed. The German cockroach is quite small, and we don't really see this as much as the other cockroaches that lobster roach is often an outdoor cockroach. Um, the German roach, occasionally in domestic house situations, particularly sort of ones that have become unsanitary, you might have German cockroach situations, particularly things like cardboard boxes, paper bags, books, things like that. Um, and interestingly, they exhibit something uh, called the fact that they are positively thigmotactic. And that's interesting because you can be negatively thigmotactic. Negatively thigmotactic is you don't want anything to touch you. Positively thigmotactic is you like things to touch you. So that's why cockroaches like corners and crevices and things because they can be touched. And so that's why they go in crevices and under things and against, you know, if they're looking, they'll go up against your cabinets when they're running away, that sort of thing. That's because that's what they're built to respond better to. Um, it's called the German cockroach. And interestingly, in Germany, they call it the Russian roach. So everybody's passing the buck. <laughs> um, household case bearer, I'm trying not to hold you up too much, but household case bearer is something you probably come across. It sort of scooches around on the floor of your house and it eats your clothes, possibly. Um, and basically, it's a little tiny caterpillar. Uh, and it makes itself a little case of whatever it can find, little bits of grit and hair and fluff and fur or carpet fibers, whatever it can find, and it sticks it all together and makes itself, combines it with silk and makes itself a little case. And so it's called a case making clothes mom, um, and it's also a case bearer. Some of them eat clothes and wool and natural fibers, and some of them eat grit and fur and hair and dead skin and things like that, but nevertheless, they look very similar. Um, and uh, it hatches, when it's finished the caterpillar stage, it actually hatches into that little tiny gray mom um, that you might see. So if you're ever in your house and you see a little tiny moth, it never flies any higher than about here, and it's very irregular flight. It's kind of up and down and all to the side. You see it, get it, because it's coming for your clothes, chances are. So bird mites, we do see this one periodically in the news. The schools have had problems with it, um, where the birds nesting in the eaves of the schools, and then what happens is these mites are feeding on the blood of the birds. They're very, very, very tiny. They get up in the feathers, and they feed on the blood of the birds, particularly the baby birds. And uh, then when the bird ha um, leaves the nest, all of the mites, or the majority of the mites, are still left in the nest. And then they will spread out, because they know that the warmth is gone, and they spread out looking for something else to feed on. And so they evenly distribute themselves on whatever is nearby, whether that's an air conditioner, a windowsill, uh, your uh, um, laundry vent, whatever it is that's there, will um, they'll just walk all over it. And it, sometimes they come in the window, in the house, in the door, um, and that's when they start becoming a problem, is then when they find you. And it's not a health problem as much as it's an irritation. They are extremely, the bites are extremely itchy. I had birds nesting in the eaves of my house in the attic. They had birds left, and I had a little hole to get into the attic where I would store stuff, and I just didn't bother closing the attic thing. And under that, I had all my clean towels. My towels super clean, but I take them into the bathroom when I needed a new one, and I you know, shower myself and dry myself off, and I was getting these bites, and I could not work out where the bird mites were coming from, and then I worked it out. They were falling out of the attic onto my towels, and then being taken into the bathroom, and it was causing a problem for me. They don't live on you, so it's not like you get an infestation of them, and you have to be treated or anything like that. They simply bite you, try to feed, 
can't, and then they will die. They don't die from you, they just die because they have not proper meal. They only live on birds. But the bites that they leave can be quite intensely, intensely itchy. And so that's why when it was in the news with the school, um, it was it was difficult for the children because it is intense, it is distracting, and it is a problem. But it can be dealt with very easily and not without you know without any pesticides or anything like that. I'm not a huge advocate of pesticides in any way and never around children. Um, but you can deal with it without pesticides. But it, it does have to be uh, removed. So SIDS, I just talk about them because they're very odd. They're extremely small, very soft bodied. They feed on mold when they're inside the house, and when they're outside, you can have ones that live on trees, and they make this funny silk webbing all along branches, and they actually live under that. And one of the reasons they live under the silk webbing is because they need a very high humidity, and in our houses, we generally have a high humidity, particularly when you've got something, a cabinet or something that's up against the wall. There's not a lot of airflow back there, and so sometimes you get a fine film of like fungal spores and things growing behind there, just that's because we live in a high humidity climate. And that's where you'll often find these things. And the best treatment is to simply dehydrate, dehydrate, is to dehumidify your um, your room or your building or whatever, wherever the problem is. Um, a lot of people find them in their kitchens, and the answer is to put your air conditioner on for several days straight, totally close everything up, and dry it out, trying to get the moisture out of the air, and that will they will simply die. So they're kind of interesting. Just want to move very quickly through our spiders. Um, the one that does get attention is this southern house spider, which is on the top right hand side. It looks very creepy, it's quite big, it's kind of black, and it looks like it'll probably kill you, but it doesn't. It makes a kind of a Halloween type of web, very creepy, and you often don't see it, but you'll probably see its web. And if I describe it to you, you may go, oh, oh, oh. if you go to cellars, pump rooms, horse stables, um, underneath of houses where there's not a whole lot of activity, but there's a web, and it will often look as if it has a hole in it, and it, the hole disappears off into nowhere. You can't really see what's going on, and it kind of opens up like kind of a funnel up against the side. That's what this spider is, and the female will be sitting inside all the way at the back, and she's just waiting. Um, and they're not toxic. They don't really cause anybody a problem, but they are kind of uh, interesting. The wood louse hunter is very small. It looks huge in this one, but it's only about, um, centimeter and a half, maybe not even. Um, lives outside, feeds on roly polies, wood lice, those little gray things, um, goes around. But apparently, it can give a nasty bite to people, but it's not going to cause any medical problems. But it just, uh, they all, all spiders, I always tell the children that I teach, I say, all spiders bite. Because they say, well, which ones are the ones that I can handle? Which ones are the ones that I can touch? Which ones aren't venomous? All spiders bite, because that's how they feed. And so every spider can give you some degree of a bite, whether or not it really affects you depends on your own health and also how big the spider is and whether or not it's actually venomous to people. And all of the spiders we have, bar one, are, um, are generally considered safe, but I teach the children just don't pick up any of them. So we know the, um, <coughs> what we call the spiny orb bellied weaver. Um, we call it the crab spider. It's very common, um, <coughs> hangs around, just looks kind of interesting. Interesting, if you Google that <coughs> family of spiders, you'll find that in other countries they're different shapes and they have different um, protrusions coming in different directions off of their body. So in other countries they have other ones that are similar but are built a little differently. <coughs> Daddy long legs, we all know <coughs> it is an urban myth that um, they have a hugely venomous bite. They don't, it is a myth. They're, they're really not, not that bad a spider. Um, <coughs> and then the golden silk spider, which we all know is what we sometimes refer to as the hurricane spider. Um, and apparently, not in Bermuda, but there is another species which is a, very similar to this. And the web, the silk of this family is so strong that they can actually pull it out and make it into fishing line because it is that strong. So this, these spiders have some of the strongest silk in their, in their webs. The spider I did want to draw your attention to, we do have here, it gets a lot of attention, is the brown widow. <coughs> Your friend on the left-hand side of that picture is the black widow. We do not have black widows in Bermuda. And in the construction industry, all the time, I am getting people very concerned, as frightening as they should be, about spiders that they're coming across. But they're actually all brown widow spiders. And you can have brown widow spiders that look so dark that they look like they could actually be a black widow. And generally, the, um, well, there's a couple of ways I can tell them apart. But one of the easiest ways is to see the egg sac. And you see in this picture, it's got two different egg sacs there. One is very unique and pointy and looks like sort of a meteorite all exploded. 
um, and the other one is very smooth. And generally, that's a very distinctive feature of the two spiders. The color alone is not 100%, but the black widow is completely